A big shout out goes to Maxis Tires, Jensen USA, and Fox Shocks for supporting the inside line. Welcome mountain bikers. We're sitting down here with Dan and Steve from Vorsprung Suspension. My name is Brian Kale, and today we're just going to be talking about suspension and more specifically a new shock that you guys have teased and seem to have been working on for a while. To start, um, what is Vorsprung and what is your guys' part in the company? My name's Steve. Uh, I'm the owner of Vorsprung. Um, what is Vorsprung? <laughs> Uh, we started off as a suspension service center, then became a suspension tuning center, then became a development center for upgrade systems for suspension. Um, and that's progressed obviously to, uh, making shocks, complete units. Um, and that kind of, I guess, came about sort of grounded in some limitations that we ran up against with, uh, with creating tuning systems for shocks. Every time we'd look at tuning shocks from you know major manufacturers, we'd have to work within their architecture and their designs. And we'd modify those to the degree that, uh, was n- that we felt was necessary to get the result that we wanted. But sometimes you'd run into uh, like essentially fundamental problems that would require too many changes. So some of those problems could be, uh, well, a a very obvious one is like, we don't want to, you know, create a tuning system for something that's unreliable where we put something into a shock or a fork um, that voids the warranty. And then the rider is left with something that, you know, possibly fails for some reason that wasn't really related to what we did. Um, So there's certain products that were kind of excluded on that basis, but there's, Fortunately, that isn't actually super common. Um, more frequently, we'd run into problems where the fundamental design of a shock prevented us from being able to get the result that we wanted without having to change basically two thirds of the shock. So at that point, um, and as our sort of manufacturing capabilities improved over time, um, we started looking at developing a, a complete shock based on um, the principles that we'd seen that worked well principles that we'd seen that you know avoiding i guess the principles we'd seen that hadn't worked so well um and trying to in some ways amalgamate the best um characteristics of various shocks on the market uh, especially in terms of reliability that's something we you know we really looked around at like what works best uh what seemed to be fairly prone and then adopted the ideas that were you know showing up as most reliable in the field um, but yeah, that's basically how the, the shock project got started. Um, we've been working on it formally for about two years now, I guess, since Dan's been involved. Um, no, it's been basically like two years full-time work there. Um, obviously had a lot of sketches and ideas floating around for a long time before that, but you know, a lot of those were things like sketching out shock layouts just to see if certain ideas could even physically fit. Um, <laughs> We have probably hundreds of designs like that kicking about. But it's a good few. There's a lot of sketches. Uh, back to the original question. My name's Dan. I'm uh, kind of the research and development engineer at Forsprung Suspension. Largely brought on board to facilitate building this project, but kind of any product that's been launched by Vorsprung in the past two years, there's a good chance I had a hand in it's design and testing. Well, you alluded to it, but um, what were some of the design limitations um, you were running into the on production shocks that you were trying to solve with this? And maybe is there an overall overarching design philosophy that's guided you to what you are working with today? Yeah, there are some fairly distinct characteristics that we were trying to avoid um for example um high speed rebound adjusters that were intrinsically digressive so some of the some of the shocks on the market like the the older double barrel coils um first generation of the x2 and so forth uh used like a a poppet valve for both high speed compression and rebound those are very good in some regards they're very light, they're simple, 
they're adjustable, they allow a huge amount of oil flow. Very straightforward to make work. Um, the downside is that you have a uh, the downside is that you have a certain characteristic once that valve opens that is basically unavoidably um, digressive. With compression damping, that's not such a problem, but in rebound damping, it's it's really not ideal. So that's you know one example of something where if we had tried to tune that generation of X2 shocks, and we did actually develop a, um, a tuning platform for that about four years ago, five years ago, um, you're very much limited by that architecture. So having to replace all that means that, you know, well, now you have to fit something in the small space that a pop valve can fit in. Um, but if you can't fit it in there, then you need like a whole replacement reservoir bridge. By the time you go into a whole replacement reservoir bridge, well, now you might as well change the compression assembly. You know, you're, you're basically making all the complicated parts of the shock. So things like that were a kind of a limitation in the tuning systems um, that we produced. And that's why, uh, that's a major reason why we never made um, a tuning system for that generation of the X2. It, I guess from some people's point of view, um, you would look at our tuning product lineup like with attractive tuning systems for super deluxes. And it's very easy, I guess, from the outside to look at that and be like, okay, well, why did you just do it for that shock? Why didn't you also do it for this shock and this shock? And the truth is that we actually tried to develop that for most shocks. Um, but most shock architectures just aren't conducive to generating the damper curves that we wanted with the adjustment ranges that we wanted and the reliability that we needed. So like if a shock, you know, if a shock gets a reputation for failure, we just don't touch it. Like we see it, you know, when we're running a service center, which we sold off uh, about 12 months ago. Uh, when we were running a service center, we'd see a lot of failures. And if we started seeing those repeatedly, we're just like, okay, we're not, we're not touching this shock. We're not going to try and tune it because um, we don't want to avoid anyone's warranty. Um, and so that, that excluded certain units. There were certain things like the DPX2 um, was another good example. We tried really hard to make a tuning product for that. And ultimately, we would have had to replace, we would have had to redesign pretty much the whole shop. Um, the way that it works is that you end up forcing all the oil flow displaced by the, the damp shaft through one of two orifice adjusters, the rebound of the compression. Um, and so the more compression damping you generate, the more oil actually gets forced backwards through the rebound. So the rebound adjuster starts having a very large effect on compression in a like basically in a ported manner uh, that you can't really get around. And so it was not really possible to get a lot of support out of that damper. Um, and we were just limited by that, by that architecture. You know, we tried very hard to get around that. We just could. And so I guess over time, as we realized that, you know, our tuning product portfolio was very limited um, in its scope by the results that we're trying to achieve. You know, like we're not just trying to have a tuning product and like a range of them. Like anyone can just punch out a bunch of, you know, damper pistons or whatever that fit every shock in the market and call them like an upgrade. But if you actually have a specific outcome in mind, then there is a certain degree of consistency that's required. Um, you know, like if, if we were, for example, creating damper pistons uh, for say, you know, shock A and shock B and marketing them both as like, oh, upgrade your shock to like the, the optimum damper curve but both of them put out something like wildly different, then it becomes clear that like neither of the, probably neither of those is optimum, let alone one of them. Um, and that, that really kind of pushed us into a bit of a position where from a, from a tuning point of view, we were limited by architecture. And from a business point of view, we were also, while we're operating a service center, kind of in a position where like, we need to be representing the companies whose stuff that we're servicing positively, right? Like we can't be sitting there and shitting on these like Fox and Brock Shops products because like for the most part, they're actually really good. Um, we don't want to be sitting there like criticizing these brands while we're also, you know, trying to offer a product with that. So that kind of um, 
created like a basically a business case to just be like, okay, go do your own thing. That way you don't have to worry about what anyone else does. You don't have to like sit here trying to be like, yeah, this is a great shock. Also, it sucks in this way. You know, which is not definitely not a <laughs> approach that I want to take. And I guess it also solves the problem of having to redesign your product every four years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a big one. Yeah. You know, like, um, you know, Luftcaps are a great example. Like, every company changes their air shafts and air springs, like, every year, it seems like. And, like, the, the fitment difficulties there are um, pretty significant. Yeah. So, like, with Smashbot, we managed to kind of design around that by making it quite modular. You change the top cap and and a foot stud and fit pretty much anything, but yeah, it's uh, it gets very difficult when you know they everything gets updated so frequently, and there's such a massive range of products. And so, we kind of figured that if we want to make like the absolute best thing that we can, if we have control over all those parameters and we can we don't have to worry about making our stuff fit other people's stuff every time they change it, that gets a lot easier as well. And Dan, you've had your hands pretty deeply into this, so what have been some of the problems you've spent the most time trying to overcome and <laughs> what what what's your kind of i guess journey with this with the shock i guess the journey starts a couple of years ago with drawings and uh with getting the initial concept onto paper and that was in itself an experience working alongside steve to try and implement the millions of ideas that he has about how he can make the best product in the world so Getting even to a stage where it was ready to move into any sort of production was a battle in itself. Without trying to give away too much, basically, you're well, the only sort of standard that we're really working to here is the metric lengths that shocks have to be to fit in certain bikes. And in in a sense, that is a limitation. Uh, There's a certain amount of space, there's a certain amount of features that can be put into that space or there's a certain amount of things you can do so that was one issue that was worked through and one that wasn't easy uh, i guess there is se- secondary to that there's like packaging constraints um so it needs to be able to fit in standard frames what we can kind of see in front of us hopefully it's visible on camera uh, is kind of what was it's kind of a first generation shock that head at least that was easy to make uh, and potentially wasn't going to be compatible with everything but it managed to fit all the features that we wanted to fit in in packaging that was packaging that was easy to machine and could be done in a rel- relatively small time scale or relatively fast time scale for, for production we'll obviously have to look at making sure that fits in everything and and we've basically got stuff that we, we've got almost a finished part essentially that will should more or less fit in most bikes um so yeah packaging was one of the big problems not to get into probably can't go into too much detail but there's features in there which have gone through multiple iterations and not when i say multiple iterations not just multiple iterations in design world in like real produced product world as well like i think of like the parts been for the shock, some of them will have like five or six revisions of the same part. Uh, whereas, and, and the fact that you've actually physically made that part is a good indication that you thought that was going to be the solution. Like if you look through des- the design work, there's probably hundreds, hundreds of revisions. And then if you look through the physical part, there's like multiples of that too. So what yeah. revision would be uh, like the... Compression and rebound pistons. Are yeah, so I think design. compression and rebound pistons are a revision 14 for actually manufactured. Like to say how many models and ideas we've come up with would be impossible. But even small things like the seal head is a probably revision eight or something like that. So yeah, we're we're really trying our best to make sure all is super reliable and performs like is industry leading in the performance. Yeah, Dan's been uh, extremely patient with uh, the constant pushing for, you know, we need to fit this in, we need to get that in, it needs to be exactly like this, it needs to do this, you know, it needs to hit all these objectives. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like the amount of, um, the amount of physical parts that we've produced, the amount of versions of them that have been put into a shop, tested, and pulled back out, revised, 
another one made, you know, reprogrammed, like phenomenally uh, iterative process and expensive and time consuming as well. Seems massively tedious and uh, tedious yeah. is a good word. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Be, yeah. 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 So it must mean you guys are uh, yeah really passionate about this. And uh, yeah, I think the general public, I mean, and speaking personally, I'm really excited to yeah see what you guys have, have created with all that time, sweat, and, <laughs> and effort. <laughs> we started the tractive tuning process, uh, I guess, initially. Like The first ideas for that were in 2010. And that was basically looking at, okay, like what happens at the wheel? You know, and so the, the, what the shock does at the shock is only indirectly relevant to how the bike rides. So, like, how that's multiplied through the, the leverage rate of the bike, what happens at the wheel, is ultimately what we're working on. So, like, what happens in there is a bike product. You know, what we're trying to do is get the bike to behave a certain way, and that requires a certain, um, certain characteristic at the wheel. And that's been developed. Like, there's a whole software side to this as well that we haven't discussed or shown. Um, but that is kind of an evolution of what we did with the, the tractive tuning. So we learned a lot from that. That gave us a lot of good benchmarks to, to aim for. Um, you know, focusing too much on what's inside the shock and exactly like how it does what it does is like, it's all a means to an end and the end is like a meter away from the shock, you know? Yeah, just what Steve said. The, the finished product is, is the ride in some ways, not the shock. So yeah. that's what we're shooting for. And we haven't forgotten about that when we're trying to make the, the component. That's cool that you guys have that in mind when you're, at the same time, so in the weeds, in the shock is like, yeah, keeping that ride experience kind of peace of mind and working backwards from that. I find that's like a cool design philosophy. So in your guys' product portfolio right now, um, what is the best selling product? And I guess what is the most common problem you're trying to solve for with the products you offer and maybe you, we can divide that up into like shock and fork if those don't really overlap to answer the initial question i would assume it's our smashbot kit uh yeah the smashbots yeah bestseller so like i say i'm the engineer here i'm not totally on the floor with the sales but yeah the smashbot kit is popular and largely is what it's probably funded my why work and <laughs> <laughs> what you see in front of me so yeah yeah, the Smashbot. I mean, we have kind of our three major products at the moment: um, Smashbot, Seekers, and Liftcap. Um, with those, uh, we've mostly focused on spring characteristics. Like we've had damp tuning uh, products and services uh, for forks in the past, like the Fractive System for the, the Fit Four dampers. Uh, our very first product was actually like a replacement compression assembly for the Thirty Four CTD back in the day, called the TLA. Uh, which for anyone who's familiar stands for three letter acronym because I couldn't really think of a better name. <laughs> um, so we have offered those damp tuning products in the past, but um, we found that you can make a much bigger improvement with forks in particular by addressing the spring issues than the damper. So that's kind of been the focus of our attention because um, basically in order of what affects performance you've got friction spring characteristic damper so the damper is kind of in the fork the, the sort of third priority right? it's not that it's not a priority but it's a lower priority than the spring um, and as a result like coil springs are kind of with smashbot an easy way to improve things get rid of the air spring friction entirely um, so you improve that quite a lot linearize the spring rate it's like a lot of boxes ticked right there. Hydraulic bottom out works well. Um, the lift cap and the seekers are kind of a little more convoluted in the approach that they take in some regards because it's still an air spring. You've still got air spring friction. You've still got, um, you know, the infinite adjustability of the air spring. Um, with the rear shock, damping is quite a lot more relevant than it is with fork. Like you can run a fork with literally zero compression damping and some forks do. Like you can, some of the RockShox forks right now, you can buy it, don't even have a compression assembly. They just have an IFP. Um, they're entirely writable, right? Like a, 
Whereas, and, and you know, some people, I don't like to admit this because it's, uh, it seems kind of antithetical to what we do in some regards, but we've had people come in, bring forks in for service. They're like, oh yeah, it feels kind of funny. You're like, yeah, your damper is blown. You have no damping at all. You're riding a pogo stick. No, like, oh, okay. Yeah, it did feel kind of funny. Like, yeah, I bet it did. But the fact that that's still rideable, you know, kind of indicates quite a bit. If you've ever ridden a blown rear shock though, you kind of realize that like doing without damping there is a bit of a different story. Like you need um, you need more control, particularly with rebound on the on the rear shock, but also with compression. And I think that comes about from the, the asymmetry of the bike, right? Like pretty much everything that you can do on a bike will tip you forwards. You can brake, you can hit bumps, whatever. It all tips you forwards. Um, Anything that tips you backwards, which is pretty rare, um, is usually like more, I would say, of a, kind of a rider movement fault than a, a bike issue or a you know, terrain issue. Um, it's relatively easy to correct for, right? Like, so say you jump something and you land kind of back wheel heavy. It's pretty it, easy to correct for unless you like literally land on your back. You know, grab the back brake, front wheel comes down. Do the same on the front wheel, so you're having a bad day. So... That asymmetry seems to require a great deal more control through the damping of the rear end than it does from the front. And so we see a lot more development um, in shock damping than we do in fork damping in that sense, I think. Because you can essentially ride a fork. Like, you can kind of ride one without a damper. It's not great. It can definitely be better if you do have appropriate levels of damping. But with a rear shock, it's actually pretty critical. I guess largely... Like Steve says, the focus has been on air springs, but that's a good good thing to focus on for forks. And if you're going to build a rear shock, then it's got to be the complete package uh, to have a damper and a spring. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With a rear shock, it's way more straightforward to throw a coil spring on it. You know, it's uh, and that's why we've started with a, a coil shock. You know, we're like, obviously, we're not purists about coil or air because I think some people are, and that's doesn't really strike me as beneficial to pick a side and be a dick about it kind of thing. Um, but yeah, we started with coils because we can just focus on the damper. We're going to get that right. Once we're sure we've got the damper right, then we'll look at doing the air spring stuff. And, you know, we have a lot of experience with air springs, so that is something uh, I have, you know, a lot of excitement about um, because I think we can do things that no one else is doing. Um, I already know there's headaches to come <laughs> if yeah. we turn the <laughs> if and when this uh, this shock platform gets an air spring. <laughs> yeah, Dan's uh, Dan's definitely spent some time um, drawing up design concepts there that uh, have yeah gone through some revisions and headaches. And Dan being like, "What the fuck, Steve? Why why do we want to do that?" <laughs> At the moment, though, they're all. They all just exist in the uh, in the cloud. So yeah, uh, the real headache starts when the making the stuff begins. Yeah. Yep. How challenging is the manufacturing side of this project versus just the design implementation and getting prototypes? Mm. There's obviously to and fro, and then part of my uh, job description is to make the is to make it possible to make these these parts and. To not give anybody anything that isn't too difficult, or at least it's not going to take so much time that it, it it's not worth it. Um, yeah, I guess I get to see a bit of a unique perspective on what Steve's doing in terms of that, and what the machinists Matt and Mitchell are doing as well. They, um, yeah, they have their own unique challenges, and Steve's there as a sounding board to essentially do what he does with me, which is a good job of like making sure things don't get out of hand but also reminding them that uh, we're we're trying to do the best like build the best stuff in the world so it's not going to be easy either yeah a lot of i spend a lot of uh a lot of my day um i guess supporting the manufacturing guys um that's that's a huge part of my mental energy i suppose <laughs> motivating them as well <laughs> <laughs> in some ways like a motivational speaker for everyone but, yeah. so in your guys' opinion you know obviously besides this shock 
what is kind of the the next like frontier for technology and development in the suspension sphere and maybe in the same breath like where do you see the biggest gap in uh, like production suspension products uh, that one's actually really easy um the next big frontier is going to be linkage forks but for the back of your bike so we're going to have like a linkage fork on the rear <laughs> Taking a bit of or quite keen interest in like the electronic stuff that's coming out from Fox and RockShox. And in some ways it kind of scares me. Like my degree is mechanical engineering and I never wanted to mess around with the electrical stuff. But the, the further down this line you go, the it seems apparent, at least to me, that that's probably the future and it's something I'm gonna have to get my head wrapped around. Uh, Somewhat with Dan on that, I think um basically Electronics uh, sort of making their way into bikes through e-bikes, through electronic suspension, AXS. So how do you say it? AXS? Access? I don't know. Um, all that kind of gear is getting more and more popular. I think um, electronic suspension so far is basically just being like an electronic gnome sitting in your bottle cage flicking your lockout lever. So that's cool, but it's an expensive way of doing something that you can do yourself. The reason for that is basically the response time of electronic stuff is still slower than mechanical stuff. Even like one millisecond, you know, I think, what did Fox claim on the live valve? Like five milliseconds or something? If you actually work out how far you're traveling in five milliseconds, it's a fair way. Like if you're moving at, say, 30 k's an hour, 40 k's an hour, um, the distance that your wheel has traveled in that time is significant. And so mechanical systems... Um, essentially still have the fastest passive response. And I don't think um, that element is likely to change until and unless someone comes up with like a much higher frequency response um, system and basically a way of anticipating the ground, right? That's like, that's the big thing that a rider can do that suspension currently can't. And, you know, th these systems, like predictive systems do exist in the automotive world. I think Mercedes have had this for a few years um, in Maybe it's in the S-Class, like predictive suspension that actually lifts the wheels up in advance of a bump with a hydraulic pump. Weighs a lot, costs a lot, you know, for a modest improvement. Um, I think where that electronic stuff will become good is when people find out the best way to integrate it with an already well-developed mechanical system. So in the past, a lot of the... Um, a lot of the electronic stuff, like, you know, Cannondale had the, the Simon fork like 12 years ago or something like that. It was basically just a, a solenoid that ran full time and just uh, adjusted an orifice in real time. It's a really energy intensive way of doing something that a mechanical system can do arguably better uh, without requiring a battery that, you know, runs out after two hours. But when people can find... Uh, more energy efficient ways of doing things like that and you've already got like a good mechanical system to build it on top of which is what rock shops were trying to do with flight attendant as i understand it um then you have the potential for kind of the best of both worlds i think and i think that like dan says that probably is uh where some of the significant advances will come from some point in the next few years but you know every time you add another variable you add another thing you got to focus on and uh, once you get to once you get to a system with too many variables, like once you've got to try to get a mechanical system to work well and an electronic system to work well and the two to integrate properly and not you know over prioritize one over the other um, or wrongly prioritize one over the other, that gets kind of increasingly complicated. Um, and I think development times for that really blow out to be like quite a long time. When did the first live valve come out? Like twenty. 17 or something. It's been, yeah. It's been a while. Yeah. I think, I think it might also be worth mentioning. It feels like maybe there's a little bit of kind of low-hanging fruit as well with just like air springs and like tech, which does yeah. exist in a way that people use it today. Like mm -hmm. there's still advances to be made with friction, with air springs, with the damping characteristics. And like if that's the stuff that's easy to get, then that's what. We'll, we'll go after first probably <laughs> yep we're getting right to the end here 
Um, maybe one last question. If each of you had the power to magically solve one issue or problem that you see in like the bike industry as a whole right now, you know, can either affect your guys' suspension uh, business or not, I guess, what would it be? On the spot, <laughs> people knowing when it's an appropriate time to uh, service their suspension. Actually, like, I've often thought it, like, it'd be kind of cool to have a sight glass in the bottom of your fork so you can kind of see the color of the oil. You just glance in there and be like, okay, like, you know, a lot of um, motorbikes have it, for example, in, uh, in the engine case. Yeah. And just like glance at it, see if the oil level is appropriate. See, is your oil like the color it was when you put it in there, or is it black and brown, like some indicator? Um, I think that would that would probably be the single uh, single biggest issue I would like to see <laughs> solved in the across the industry. Actually, no, fuck that. Get rid of Trunnion. Trunnion yokes. <laughs> get rid of Trunnion. Get get rid of uh, extension yokes. It's actually so easy to jump on any sort of bandwagon i don't want to dovetail myself into any kind of group here like you could jump on the like let's get rid of derailleur bandwagon or like let's do this and i don't know on the spot it's really hard to think of something in some ways the like the lack of industry standing uh, it's not in industry standard testing bothers yeah. me but also it's like kind of good as well because you, you don't want these standards or tests to be to be invented by people who don't know what they're talking about or what they're doing or don't have experience. So it's if you have any sort of uh, regulatory board of anything, they need to be more knowledgeable than the people that are, or just as knowledgeable as the people who are designing the product. So yeah, it's you have to tread carefully if you're going to go down that route. I think. And that's, I'm guessing you're talking Trunnion. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like anyone can sort of invent a standard, and yeah. the next day, every single or half the bikes that come out of yeah have that standard and in some ways that's a good way to get things done quickly but man mm -hmm. it can also lead to setbacks and it can well can, yeah i think one of the things that would actually be massively beneficial like we see a lot of um shock failures that get blamed on uh the shock manufacturer where in my opinion it's probably not the fault of the shock it's probably the fault of the frame what i think the industry can benefit from is dynamic alignment standardization dynamic alignment standards for trunnion mount shocks in particular. Uh, so where you put like the, basically a certain amount of side loading on the frame, um, cycle it through the travel and see what kind of alignment the, the shock mounts can maintain. Um, and if you can specify a tolerance on that, then at least you can ch test the shocks to it, right? So without that data though, and without you know having to say, okay, the frame has to comply with this and the shock has to comply with this. If you can do both, then you can make sure that everything works in harmony. Um, and then trunnion becomes completely acceptable. Without that kind of a standard um, to test to, everyone's just stabbing in the dark. You know, the shock manufacturer's like, okay, we're trying to make the shock strong enough. Frame manufacturer's like, okay, we're trying to make the frame stiff enough. But if the frame is really stiff and misaligned, well, okay, great. Now you've <laughs> made it even harder for the shock. I'm sure, there's probably, or there might be somebody watching this in the automotive world, which is who are all, they're almost jealous. They're like. I can't believe you guys get to do whatever you want and you don't it doesn't need to pass some tests. So yeah, like yeah. I say, it's easy to jump on any bandwagon. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And you know, for all my uh for all my shitting on Trunion and Yokes, you know, it was so bad that uh the you know, every single shock out that was failing as a result of it, the bike manufacturers themselves would um would have stopped using it entirely, right? Like it's obviously not that severe that uh it's causing such a high warranty rate that you know, yeah, the big, bike industry is customer regulated in some ways. It kind of <laughs> is, essentially. Yeah. It kind of is. But I think it's also um, because the frame manufacturers are buying from the shock manufacturers. When the shock fails, they're like, hey, it's a vendor problem. And like we've seen this a lot coming from the automotive industry as well, um, that if you are, say, Toyota and you have a problem with the part that you, you know, that's failing uh, in the field, that typically gets put on to the, the vendor. Um, and the vendor has to kind of suck it up because they're the one selling to the, the big OEM company, right? Whereas if it was the other way around, if you had the fork and shock manufacturers purchasing the frames, they'd be like, hey, your frame sucks. It's destroying the shock. Go fix it. Um, but because of the direction of purchasing, we don't see that.
it just gets pushed onto the shock manufacturer, and they're just like, okay, well, we're we're fortunate to be in a position where we can openly criticize this stuff because we're not trying to sell to OEMs. Like this shock, maybe one day bike companies will buy it from us, but that's certainly not our focus in you know any time in the foreseeable future. So we can say, hey, look, this frame eats shocks. Don't put it on this frame. You know, if we were trying to sell like a million dollars worth of shocks to track or specialize in someone, like dangerous things to say, you know, <laughs> but we're not. So I guess one last question. How close is this thing in rough estimation for customers being able to click a button and buy it? We're aiming to have this uh, ready early next year. So by next kind of northern summer, we are doing like a pre-production run fairly shortly, uh, which We'll be sending out shocks to a lot of our uh, distributor network around the world, our dealer network, um, getting feedback from other service centers because you know the guys that see all the stuff in the field are the ones that have some of the best feedback for us. Um, and we'll be putting a few uh, riders on them, basically to just try and destroy them, see like you know what fails, what needs to what needs to be updated or improved. Uh, because as much as we've put a huge amount of uh, time into this ourselves like you know like dan said the bike industry is customer driven um if people come back to us and they're like hey you know we think that this shock is like the rebound range is too small or something like that we're going to adjust that before we start making large numbers of them uh, you know we're trying our best to to get to a point before we even send anything out there um that we're confident in that but it's uh I think it would be arrogant of us to assume that we get everything right first go because like we see it time and time again with companies with way more resources than us that, you know, like even the Olin's first coil shot from mountain bike had some issues like cutting up the top out bumper and little slivers of rubber getting caught in the shims and the thing would lose its rebound dabbing. And like, if Olin's don't get it right on the first go, the chances that we are going to get it right, like first go, zero, you know? So like we admit that, just looking at how we mitigate that and get to like a robust product. Um, and that's why we're going through the like this pre-production process at the moment. So. Well, I think that's a super humble approach and I think the end customer will definitely appreciate that. Um, I hope so. So I think that's about it uh, for today's discussion. Really appreciate your guys' time. Likewise. And yeah, uh, I think people are going to be really pumped when this thing comes out. So. Thanks for watching, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll catch you guys next time. A big shout out goes to Maxis Tires, Jensen USA, and Fox Shocks for supporting the inside line.